Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Show with your host, Jeff Lopes. We are live. We are live in the Jeff Knows Inc. Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on. Big smiley over here, John Hewlin. How are you, brother? I am fantastic, brother. How are you? Fantastic. John is a podcast host, certified coach, speaker. There's so many layers to you. We're going to, Dad, we're (laughs) going to talk about a lot of things today. Usually when I start our podcast, we usually dive into where the guest is currently in their life and what they're currently doing. We're going to switch it a little around with you. We're going to start off with John as a child. Let's let's start off. Let's get in deep today. Let's start (laughs) off with with John growing up and, and give me a little rundown of how you were and how were you with this kid? Where'd you grow up? How many siblings you had? Just give me a little rundown. Okay, sure. Um, I was born in St. Louis. Um, it's my, uh, uh, for those of you who are wondering, I'm 51. So 1970 is when I was born. Um, you know, grew up in, uh, in St. Louis, they referred to things in counties. So not these little suburbs where you live, although they have them, but it's yeah. what county. So it was South County is where I was born and I grew up for about seven years until my parents got divorced in 1979. Uh, when my parents got divorced, I went with my dad, my sister went with my mom. And so my dad got a job in Lake of the Ozarks, which is kind of like central Missouri. It's and- Ozarks, Ozarks, the TV show Ozarks? Yeah, the TV show Ozarks, there's like, there's Lake of the Ozarks. And then if you go a little further down into Arkansas, something's called Table Rock Lake. So yeah. kind of that, almost that entire area is referred to in general as the Ozarks. Branson is considered part of the Ozarks. So it's, it's kind of really big, but there's an actual lake called Lake of the Ozarks. And that's where we lived. Uh, my dad was a service manager at a marina. So it's kind of like being a service manager at a car dealership is just yeah. for boats. Yeah. So, um, so we, we lived down there for a couple of years. My dad got remarried. Uh, we moved to the Kansas City area, uh, specifically Grandview is where I, with my growing up years. Um, gosh, what else to tell you? Uh, so soccer, when, soccer when was you, my big thing. I loved playing soccer. You so. did. Huh? So when you grew, when you, when your parents separated in, in, you were seven years old. How old was your sister at the time? I, I was nine when you my parents nine? got divorced. My mm. sister was two years younger than me. She's two so and a half years younger than me. So she so was she seven, was six and a half? Six and a half, seven range. Yeah, when that split happened. First off, I mean, that's, that's, you were at that age where you truly could gasp and understand what was happening. You're still, you're, you're at a good age to understand. So you're, you're that emotionally changing age. How often did you see your mom? Because you did move away. Right. That's a good question. I, I want to put one little detail in there that may help clarify yeah. some things. My dad told me two years prior that the divorce was going to happen. So at seven, he told me it was coming. So essentially, I was waiting for the shoe to drop for two years. Now, there's, there's a whole psychological bend to that. And I don't know if you want to get into that. We can. But um, the point is, you were asking about... Um, my, you were asking about my sister? No, I was asking about yourself. Like, like when you guys did separate and you moved. Oh, with my mom. How often did I see my mom? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, it was weird. We, we moved down there. It, it was in August. So Christmas of that year, my mom actually came down to visit and stayed with us. And it was very weird and very confusing. And oh, it was just, I think my parents were trying to think about reconciling, but it... They were a combustible couple, if you know what I mean. It just it never really worked. Um, and so it, it was over. And not long after that, my dad met. And when I say not long, I mean a week later, my dad met a woman who became my stepmother. So he met her New Year's Eve, 79. Uh, like... A, Sometime right after my birthday, my birthday's in March, some, yeah. sometime right after my birthday, they got married. Like, so like three months later. Wow. Yeah, you know, they were married. Um, so I had a stepbrother and stepsister who were older than me, um, live with us. And then my dad got the job in Kansas City. So we all moved up here. Uh, I say up here because I still live in the Kansas City area, different yeah. part, but I still yeah. live here. So, but how often I saw my mom after my dad remarried and we moved to Kansas City, I saw my mom a couple times a year, maybe. 
So not particularly, I mean, I talked to her on the phone and stuff that back when you actually had to pay for long distance phone calls. <laughs> That's how long ago that was. I realized there were going to be some people listening to this like paying for a long distance phone call. What are you talking about? But oh yeah, it was very expensive to do. So yeah, of course there's, I mean, especially for some reason, I mean, the nourishing, the nourishing like side of having a mom there, like how much did you miss of that? As you got older, did you realize you missed it or was it ever a miss? Like where, where was your mindset growing up? Like not having that, that gap there. And I know you had a stepmom, but it's always your mom, right? Yeah. It, it trust me, it was not the same with my stepmom as it was with no. my mom. Yeah. Um, in fact, I mean, I'm still, I'm still very close with my mom today. Um, you know, it, there were some challenges for sure. I mean, the distance certainly played a part in it. Um, you know, as, as a kid, you and your parents split like that. You feel like you have to be loyal to both sides and it's hard, especially when the parties, either one or both are saying negative things about the other ones to you. Yeah. Um, that made it very challenging. And so then of course you feel like you have to defend the parent who's being, or, you know, things were being said about him or her. And so that was challenging for sure. But as far as your question about my mom, um, yeah, I missed my mom a lot. I mean, I, I love being able to see her, but deep down inside at that point in my life, I knew I was in the right place. Meaning I knew I, I needed to be with my dad. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. Can I ask um, you why? Why would you say that? That's a very powerful statement. It, it is. And that is something I would probably answer offline. Okay. Uh, more so to, to be respectful of my mom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. Because my mom listens to my interviews. So <laughs> yeah, 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 I appreciate that. How is your relationship with your sister now that you're growing up? You know, I have one of those families that is just kind of weird. And what I mean by weird is we're not particularly close. None of us. Um, you know, when, when I uh, got married, I married into a family that was very close. And I got to see firsthand what it was like to have a family that was kind of there for each other. It did things with each other all the time. It's, it's, it was almost like I was in a TV show like an after school special sort of thing. That's what it felt like to me because I didn't grow up with that. Yeah. And so it was kind of surreal, but I loved it. And then we'll get into more of my story later. So I don't want to jump too far yeah. ahead, but that was something that I really enjoyed. And it made me realize deficits in my own family. So it's not like my sister and I don't care for each other and don't like each other. That's not true at all. It's just, she lives halfway across the country and she lives in Florida and she has her own family and her own things going on. And I have the same kinds of things. So it's been difficult with her. Um, Do you guys talk ever? Like how many times a year would you guys pick up? Yeah, talk? we talk a few times a year. Yeah. Um, so not particularly often, probably she and I need to do a better job of doing that, especially as our parents age. We definitely need to do a better job of that. And I, and I'm, I'm not pointing the finger at her. Trust me. I am pointing yeah. it anytime. Of course, you know this. Anytime you point the finger at somebody, you got three pointing right back at you. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why am I saying that is just, and this is something I've been talking a lot about lately in a lot of my podcasts and interviews and stuff is, is how I've realized the last two, three years, how much more I appreciate time as a currency. Oh yeah. For and real. as we're getting older, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that we look at John and, and, and we look at our parents and we look at our siblings and we look at, how much time we truly have. And somebody just gave this, gave me this the other day and they said, let's take the, take the number 80 and 80 is the average age. An average person lives nowadays now to subtract your age. Yeah. So you how old are you? You said I'm 51. Okay. So that gives you 29 summers roughly left in your life. Yeah. Scary. That is scary. So it makes you also realize, are you, First off, doing what you love, do you what you have a passion for? Second, are you spending the right time with the people in your life that you want to be with? And are you spreading that energy around to the family members that might not be around you so much longer? So there's so many ways you can look about that, right? At the same time, right. too, you only have 24 hours in a day. Maybe 
there are individuals in your life, even though they're family, they shouldn't be there. They are wasting your time. So there's, a, there's ways even to push people away when you think about that as well. True, true. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it's important to, for me anyway, to with some regularity do that sort of self-reflection yeah. and figure out, okay, it starts with, it doesn't start with the other people. It starts with me yeah. figuring out who I am who I want to become, where do I feel like I'm going, where do I need to be going, and who should be a part of that journey. Yeah. I mean, that for me is is because it starts with me. Because if I focus on the other folks and I'm not sure about who I am and where I'm going, I could very easily have the wrong people with me. Not because there's anything wrong with the people, but because it's just, they're not aligned. It's not a fit. No, they're not aligned with the, with your with, with right. your path. Hundred percent. Yeah, I, I'm I'm in the same same understanding as you. And I do believe that that's exactly what my mindset is. You have to align, and you and it's constantly changing. Your path, mm. your thought, it could change overnight. It could change by a, a, a split second of something happening, an occurrence in your life, a moment in your life. So it's being able to alter and reevaluate every moment and figure out your next path. Like who's the right people that are going to be there by your side? Right? Yeah, I appreciate that. Sure. So let's fast forward a little bit. Okay. You got eight, married at what age? I was 24. Young. Do you think it was, it was, you were too young at that point or you, or you were at a good age when you got married? I don't think so. I was at a okay. good age. Um, yeah. the, the person I married was younger than me, five years. She had just turned 19 when we got married. Um, uh, just to kind of set the stage for everyone. Yeah. Um, Mother's Day, 1994, which was May 8th. There's a reason I know the date. Um, my best friend and my roommate in college, uh, he and his sister and three other students at the university I was attending, uh, died in a car accident. Wow. Yeah. So that was May 8th, two weeks after that, I graduated from college. And then two weeks after that, I got married. So those three things happened in one month. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, the first and, and the wedding was planned already. Oh yeah. It had already yeah. been planned. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, the first six months I was married, I have almost no memory of. I mean, th- there were pictures of things we did and places we went. I don't hardly remember the honeymoon at, at all. I started grad school during this time. In my first semester of grad school, I don't really remember that much. Sometime around Christmas is kind of when the fog lifted. Explain fog. Was it more... It was a depression. I, did, depre- sure. I was going to say, say a depression and denial that, that what was really happening or what had occurred. Oh, oh, it wasn't a denial. No, I knew no. it had. It's just my body didn't know how to deal with it. How to accept it. Yeah. I mean, it just, yeah. I knew it was there. I knew the reality of it. Um, it's just, I, I didn't know how to move forward. Yeah. It, emotionally, I didn't know how to move forward. I mean, I mean physically and in the day to day, I did. I mean, yeah. I existed, but I didn't live, if that makes sense. No, 100%. So when. Which, was which I know was really hard for for my wife at the time. I knew it, it had to be really, really hard on her. When was the moment that you felt some form of clarity? Like how, how many, how much time later, how much months later that you started getting, like you said, the fog started re- living, removing, and, and you started getting some more clarity of, of everything and more of a clear picture of everything. It was probably between Thanksgiving and Christmas of that year. So about six months. That's when things really started. Did you, did you, did you see a therapist or you did this on your own? I did it on my own. Um, You know, it's funny you mentioned therapists. Not that anyone had mentioned to me going to therapy at the time because nobody did. Yeah. Um, But the interesting thing is growing up, I had had some encounters with some therapists and I am using that term very loosely right now. Okay. Um, I I saw what I believe to be were some quacks, to be honest with you. Okay. And it really stunted my emotional growth from seeing these folks at a young age. It really, really did. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd be happy to give you an example of what I mean. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 100%. All right. Well, so my dad and stepmom had the family go and see a therapist. I was probably 12 at the time, about 12, maybe 13, but I think, I don't think I'd made my teens yet. So this therapist met with each of us individually. So I go in there and of course at the time, I, I think it would, may have been common practice. This, this, <laughs> this man had me doing the ink blot test. Okay. What do you see in there? Yeah. I'm 12 years old. This is an adult. I'm, t- I'm taught 
that if an adult asks you a question, you answer it. Yeah. So I did. I started answering his questions. What do you see in here? What do you see? In here? And so I started answering him. I did, we do like three or four of them. And then he stops. He stops me. And he says, hold on. He leaves the room, goes and talks to my parents. Our session's done. No one told me anything after that. All I knew is my parents wouldn't let me out of their sight for like a month. So this, this guy, I think he thought something was mentally unstable with me because of whatever I saw in these inkblot pictures. <laughs> so, um, that was my first real experience with someone who called himself a therapist. I'm not sure I would refer to him as that. But that affected me later on in life. And I mean, so much so that I kind of fought against getting help when I should have in a couple of instances. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I can see that. I mean, I'm personally on a personal level, I've never, I've never gone to a therapist. Um, I never found the need to go to one, but I've, I've had friends going through dramatic situations in their life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've heard some positive stuff. I mean, a, a proper therapist is, is, is essentially a life coach, right? You're, you're there to listen. You're there to intake and listen. You're not there to tell or push. Right. And, it, it, and sometimes you just need somebody that's, that, that's unfamiliar to talk to. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the way I try to describe it to people is this because part of what I do is coaching. Now, some of what I do is life coaching. That's not yeah. all the coaching I do. But I have people ask me that because there are times when our conversations start getting into some deeper stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and I have to say, well, time out. Um, what you really need right now is therapy. And that is not what I do. I do coaching. And so the, the way I differentiate it is I tell people therapy is for helping you deal with things from the past. Coaching helps you deal with things as they are and helps you get where you say you want to go. I emphasize the word say because sometimes on the journey, you discover where you say you wanted to go is not where you needed to go at all. And that coach helps redirect you. Yeah, yeah. Just Little nudges here and there along the way to help you get to that, that point where it's going to be the most helpful for you. Yeah, I love that. That's a great, great, great analogy of, of coaching. So... Fast forward, how many okay. years were you married for? And then we're going to get uh, into your children and all that stuff. Let's talk about Yeah, ju just shy of 16 years. Okay. And this is one thing you're very open and very passionate about explaining. And not always explaining something you, you, you've said many times to myself, and I've heard you say in, in other conversations and in, in dad talk and whatnot, is you feel your separation could have been avoided. Yes. Let's, let's talk about that a little. I think that's a very powerful thing for a lot of people to hear that are going through situations sure. like that right now. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to start off with something that played a part in it. 100%. Um, and, and, and there isn't any one th contributor. There wasn't one thing that like broke the camel's back. It's just a combination of a whole lot of things okay. over the years. Um, I don't know for sure that your entire audience is made up of entrepreneurs, but I suspect that there are a lot. Yeah. And do you know what the national average is for entrepreneurs when it comes to divorce rate? I know in Canada, I don't know what it is in the U.S. or nation and national, but in, in Canada, I think it was, it was a little over 55%. Uh, this was based on a study from yeah. Harvard Business School in 2018. Yeah. Uh, 65%. Yeah. yeah, I believe it. And for, for those of you who don't know a lot about stats, um, I have a couple friends who actually have PhDs in statistics, which first of all, I didn't even know you could get, <laughs> but apparently you can. And what they told me is that a 15% increase in anything is considered statistically significant, which means you need to pay attention. Something's going on here. Now, realizing, of course, you have to break all that down and figure out, okay, what exactly is going on in each couple situation? But now this isn't true across the board. However, many of the situations, it's one person is the entrepreneur and the other person has a traditional or what we sometimes call regular job. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. And so it can be very difficult if you're not having the kinds of open and honest communication 
that is so necessary in a marriage. Um, I mean, that had a lot to do with, with ours is, is not having the kind of communication. I mean, I'll go into another one. We didn't have a regular date night. We didn't. And if we did have date night, she set everything up, everything. She made, she figured out where we were going, what we were doing, made sure the kids were taken care of. All I had to do was show up. Many times she'd already picked out what she wanted me to wear anyway. So, you know, I get ready and we go and be fine and, and all that sort of thing. But again, it all had been on her uh, to figure that out. Um, gosh, so many other factors. <laughs> oh my gosh, so many. So what you're trying to explain is you took her for granted. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I did. And I think a lot um, of people go through relationships and, and that is a, a common denominator for a lot of separations. And I do believe that is you take the other person for granted. You never really truly understand what they're feeling or thinking or going through. Because, because I didn't ask questions. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. didn't ask because I didn't want to know. I mean, not, I would not, not want to know. Not, conscious, you... not consciously, yeah, I was but say. unconsciously for sure. I, I just didn't want to know because I was afraid of what she was going to tell me. Was it that, John, or was it you're so, you're so focused on yourself and what you were trying to accomplish that you just thought everything else was fine? If there, was no, if there wasn't a fire, there's no reason to pull out the water. I don't, that make... think that, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. Yeah. So I, I think there were many factors. That definitely was one, for sure. If, if there wasn't something that was just, you know, if the kids aren't dying and you're not bleeding in the street, it doesn't need my attention. Yeah. I need to be doing other things. Yeah, but I think that's a very what you're saying is is as much as a lot of individuals will on a minute. Mm -hmm. I think is a very very common thing, and it doesn't even have to be entrepreneurs. I think it is very you're common right. in certain even certain careers that people that they're so involved in their day to day operations of their job that when they get home, it's just like it's their safe haven. It's like everything else is fine at home. Like why are police officers like two of them, but my two, my, my best man at my wedding when two of my closest friends were all police officers, why are mm. police officers, they're all divorced. My, my, yeah. my, my best friend at my wedding has been divorced twice. And it's, and it's, it's the exact same thing. It's where you're so focused on your day to day stresses, anxieties of your common job. Then when you get home, you just feel like everything's fine here. It looks fine. Let's just let it right. be. And, and you never truly understand what is happening in your home life. Yeah. It was, it was essentially rotting from the inside out. Yeah. Is uh, what was going on. Because yeah. everything looked fine yeah. on the outside, but the inside, it was just falling apart. And honestly, by the time I realized how bad it was, it really was kind of too late. It really was. And that's because this is just a little bit of teaching time here from me. Yeah, yeah. And, and hopefully, you know, other people, men and women alike, if you can get something from this, I hope that you do. Um, it's not just paying attention to things. That's not quite enough. It's being fully engaged and fully present when you're at home. Um, I, I mentioned that date night thing, and there's a reason for that. And date night, it's not, it was, it's not about the fun part of it. I'm not saying fun isn't important. I'm saying that's not what's key. It's spending regular time together and you're not talking about things like you're not talking about the bills. You're not talking about errands that are coming up or what's going on with the kids. You're not talking about any of that stuff. You know, you're asking her, baby, what's going on with you? T tell me, tell me some of your dreams that you, you've been afraid to talk about. Tell me about some of those. And you share some of the same things back with her. And it's like, okay, where do we want to be as a couple? Even as short as a month from now. How do we want to be different as a couple and growing together? What is that going to look like six months from now, a year, five years from now? What do we want that to look like? How do we become the couple that others come to for advice? That's, if I ever do get remarried, Jeff, that's what I want. I want to be in a marriage where we're the couple that others come to. It's like, that's what we want. They're not perfect. No one's perfect. But they're working on it and you can see it. Yeah. They, yeah. they actually, and I'm going to use this word on purpose. They treasure each other. Yeah. Yeah. And that is huge. Oh my gosh. So huge. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, I what, what I think happens for men many times, this is, 
again, this is my belief. I don't put this on anybody else. I believe that with inside of men, it is hardwired into our DNA to pursue. We know how to do it, man. We do. But something inside of us changes. The moment we get married, there's like a switch in our brains that gets turned off. We got her. Don't need to pursue anymore. What we have to learn how to do is to continue to pursue because that's what she wants. That's what she needs. That's what the relationship needs. And in addition to that, when I mentioned the communication side of that, that whole sharing that those, those thoughts, those feelings, that kind of stuff. I know for most guys that scares the crap out of you. I know it does. It shouldn't, but it does. Right. It absolutely shouldn't, but it does. It's yeah. because when we're boys, many times we're not taught, we don't see it and we don't hear it, that that's important. We hear things like, boys don't cry. So immediately I'm told if I have a feeling inside of me that generates that sort of thing, I got to clamp down on that because it's not right for me as a boy becoming a man to do that, which of course is garbage. Yeah. Total garbage. So it's not like you can't be an alpha male and have feelings and emotions. I think that makes you a better male. Of course. Because you've got your, your maleness that's clearly you as a man. Yeah. But then there's this other, you can call it softer side. You call it whatever you want. Vulner, vulner, being vulnerable. Thank you. Yes. Because that's how people relate. They relate to each other when they're vulnerable. Because if you can't do that, you're not going to have real relationships. They're going to be all surface level. And trust me, when I tell you, Jeff, I'm not interested in that. Yeah. There's enough people I know in surface level. I don't need any more. I need deep, meaningful friendships and relationships with other people. People I know that I can count on. People I know that will also be truth tellers in my life. Tell me the truth in love. Yeah. 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 I think a lot of this has to do with even, I mean, we could even go back to parents, right? I mean, everything you're saying is when a child's growing up, allowing your children to be vulnerable, even your, 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 your boys, let them be vulnerable, let them be open, have that open conversation with them. And I think that's, it's the duty of the parents to open up the, have those questions, those conversations. And I love what you said prior. I'm going to dive back into that. And something I, I hold very close to my, my heart is um, me and my wife, we try to, I mean, at least four or five times a week, we go for just long, long walks after the kids mm. are already in bed. We literally Love like that. nine, nine thirty, the kids are down and we'll literally go for a good, good mile, mile and a half, just walk around the neighborhood. <laughs> nice. And it's our time of just talking. Yeah. End of the age, we just talk. It could be about mm-hmm. anything. It could be about anything. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes we talk about the kids. Sometimes we talk about life. Sometimes we talk about things we want to do, but it's, it's our way of just what's on my head, what's on her head. We just let it out. And I think that helps so much to the point where we've been married for so long. And we're very, I think we talked about this before. We have, we have this very weird dynamic where my wife's the very new, nurturing, loving one. I'm the more the, the military. I'm going to get my kids to be the best that they could be. Teach them by example. <laughs> but I'm always the dad that's there. I'm always yeah. there. And... That's because huge. of that, we have that, we have that different dynamic. So the kids get both sides, but as a couple, I mean, we've been married for 18 years and I tell everybody this, we don't have one bank account together. Mm. She has her bills. I have my bills. She's very independent. She has her career. I have my career. Okay. She would never, I, I've been self-employed for 25 years. She'll never work for me. She will never from day one. She said, never think I'm ever going to work for you. <laughs> and, and I appreciated that. Right. Because mm-hmm. it gave me that sense of, you know what, she's going to trust in me what I'm doing with my career. She's mm-hmm. not going to question it. She'll support it from the outside. Let okay. me fall, stand up. She'll be there and give me a little pat on the back, but she's just the one behind me. She, and when it comes to my career, and then I, I, I'm very supportive on her career. I'm very supportive of what mm-hmm. she's doing, very supportive of her being independent female and having her bills and being able to buy what she wants. And does she do it's like, it's not like one of those things like, okay, I want to buy this purse. Okay, honey, I'm going to go take the money out of her account. No, she has her bills. She has my money. I have her money. She does what she wants. I do what I want. And because of that, we never already about money. And that is in relationships, a big issue. Money is something that comes oh, around quite a bit, right? Yeah. And you, you know, the, the thing is in general, yeah. you have to figure out what works for you as a couple. hundred percent. Honestly. Now it's not like you can't take suggestions from other people or learn from other people. Many times what ends up working the best is you just find your own version 
of whatever it is. It's maybe you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and you kind of shake it all up. And then it's like, this is what works for us. And in addition to that, sometimes in the early days, what works is not what works once kids come along. Of course. And not what works once they become teenagers. And then once they're out of the house, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's different phases. I mean, just like how you look as a person changes over the years, your relationship should be changing over the years. It should be beginning, uh, not just getting stronger and more dynamic because it should, yeah. but it's just, it's going to look very different 15, 20, 30 years in than it did in the early days. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. So let's talk about your kids. Okay. You adopted two young ladies. Yep. When was that? How long, how many years into your marriage? What was your mindset when you went that route? Because that is such a powerful passionate thing you did. And wh- where was your mindset? What angled you there? Like just talk about the whole emotional and, and, okay. and, the, and the mental side of getting yourselves ready for that. And, and where did you go and all that stuff? This is bring give me a little story behind that. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are watching this behind me, you see pictures of me with my kids. So these are my kids. That's my son, Ethan, over there. He's 20, almost 21. He's a junior at Kansas State University. Um, That's my daughter, Andrea. She's 16. And that's my daughter, Tatum. She's 15. Uh, The girls are half-sisters, so they have the same birth mother. They're 10 months apart in age. Um, We were six years, actually, to the day in our marriage when Ethan was born. So he was born on our anniversary, which is a very interesting story in and of itself. But um, yeah, so he was, he was born in 2000 and prior to that, and I I had known this, my, my then wife um, had always wanted to adopt a little girl from China. But when we started investigating that, it was about $18,000 to get a little girl from China, which we didn't have. And so we went the route of foster care to adopt. So where, where we were living at the time, where I still live now in the state of Kansas, um, you don't deal with SRS because it's privatized. You deal with an agency and the agencies bid on contracts for both foster care and adoption. Because once a child transitions from being strictly in foster care to being adopted, Sometimes they can move agencies. Now, if we were fortunate that the agency that we were working with had the contracts for the county where the girls came from and the county where we lived. So Andrea was the first. We got her from the hospital at seven days old. She lived with us for six months. During this time, her paternal grandmother found out about her existence, which she didn't know about prior. And so in a very long story short, she ended up, leaving to go live with her paternal grandmother. That was in May of 05. So she was born November of 04. September of 05 is when Tatum was born. And Tatum came to live with us from the hospital and she never left. So she's born September 05 and it's October of 06, early October when her adoption was finalized, when Tatum's was finalized. Just prior to Andrea's second birthday, so it was, it was like the week before Halloween, Andrea came back to live with us. So she's almost two at the time. She couldn't speak a word. She could scream and grunt. She was missing half her hair. Her color was very, very light. As you can see in the picture, she's not particularly light. No. But it, her color was very light. Um, she had a double ear infection. Uh, her four bottom teeth were brown. We thought rotted, fortunately stained because grandma gave her apple juice in her crib all the time. But yeah, just, and she literally came to us with the clothes on her back. So we got the call about her coming, you know, of course, you know, when they say, do you want her? Well, immediately we say, yes, of course. And so, you know, I run out and I'm, I'm buying clothes like a madman for this little girl who has nothing literally other than the clothes are on her back. Um, And so our youngest Tatum, we were teaching sign language at the time. So I taught Andrea, if you can see this cookie. uh, So she would eat. She gained five pounds her first week with us. That's actually really hard for a small child to do. Yeah, of course. And she did. Um, Anyhow, 
So that's when Andrea came back to live with us and her adoption was finalized March of 08. So that's when uh, that was complete. Um, that's kind of the story about the girls and, and how we got them. Um, and so it's, th th there's more to it than that, of course. I mean, there's a lot of other details and stuff that go into course, it, but that's, that's kind of the highlights of it. You know, when, when you separated, they, they moved in with your now current ex-wife. Are, are they still in the same state or they moved out of state? They have moved out of state. And so my, my ex-wife and her husband, my girls, and then they have had a child since then, um, moved to Texas. How long ago was your separation? Uh, you mean when did they move or when did, when when did, did you separate? When did you and your ex separate? Well, our, our divorce was finalized May, uh, May, hello, April 1st, 2010. April so a little 1st. over 11 years ago. So it's been 11 years. So how yeah, it's, it's been a while. Yeah. How often do you see your, I know the other day you said you saw them um, when we talked last. How often do you see your stepdaughters? Uh, well, they're not my stepdaughters. Oh, they're, they're my your daughters. Yeah, 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 your daughters. Yeah, I they're my daughters. Yeah. But, um, well, prior to COVID, yeah. I was seeing them three, maybe four times a year. Um, now in 2020, I, I did see them once. And that was because they were, they came here to help my son move into his apartment at Kansas State University. But I didn't see them at Christmas or Thanksgiving at all. Yeah, it's been, it's been um, a rough year. It's been a rough year for that, huh? Yeah, it has. Um, it's, it's been challenging. Uh, there, there's certainly other things that have been going on too, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's where they are and that's how long they've been, that they moved away Thanksgiving time, 2018. So it's been about two and a half years. How's they, your relationship with your son now that he's in college? You know, I think we have the relationship that he wants right now. And that's, he kind of keeps me at a distance, but he's 20 almost 21. You know, he's just, he's feeling things out and he's trying to figure out who he is and who he wants to be as a man. And he's trying to prove himself and, and can I do things on my own? Can I not? That kind of stuff. So I think he is, he's trying to act like he doesn't need me as much and that's okay. He doesn't have to need me. That's not what I mean. Um, I mean, I'm glad that he's becoming his own person and kind of developing, developing himself as an adult. Um, so the relationship we have today, I think is very different than it'll be in a few years once he's out of college and has started his career and that sort of thing. So I've, in fact, it's funny. My, I was talking to my mom the other day. My mom says, you know, you have a very convenient memory sometimes. I'm like, what does that mean, mom? I don't even know what you're talking about. She goes, you know, when you were his age, you didn't call that much. You didn't stay in contact with me that much. I said, mom, we had to pay for long distance calls at that time. So that's part of why I didn't. She goes, no, no, no. Don't you be using excuses. It's like, you just, you didn't, but that was part of the deal. That was part of you growing up. And she says, I learned that. And it's like, okay. So that's, that's part of a learning process for me. It's hard though, man. It is so hard. I mean, these, these ones that, I mean, were teeny tiny that you're holding in your arms, which, okay, 20, almost 21 years ago. Yeah. That sounds like a long time. Man, it, does. It, it flies. Nothing. By. It flies. It by. is nothing. No, it flies. Oh by. gosh. I'm looking at my daughter. My daughter's just started high school this year, and mm -hmm. it's like, it feels like yesterday. I was, I was, I, I, she was two and a half doing her little ballet mm -hmm. classes in her little tutu, and I was sitting outside on a, on a chair for two hours, four or five days a week. Like it feels like yesterday. It literally feels oh, like yeah. yesterday. I would watch her in the, through the glass, like. <clears throat> time flies. It's incredible how quickly time flies. And that's why going back to our original conversation, when we started earlier today, how I've really taken appreciation to time as a currency. When I look at my parents, look Absolutely. at everything else. And, and you go through that stage when your kids, as a, as a, a young parent, your kids are growing up, you're so focused on them, on their health, especially we went everything with my son where he had, to, he right. was getting so much attention four or five hours a day of therapies and stuff we we're doing with him that you fast forward. It's like, it just flew by. Like literally the last 12, 14 years have just gone by just like by a blink of an eye, right? So yeah, you do appreciate that. I'm going to change the story up a bit here and let's talk okay. about, there's a few things, we're, we're getting almost an hour here. Let's talk about 
your podcast? When did that start? Okay. Relationships and revenue. Let's talk about that. When did it start? How did it all come about? How many episodes you're in? And, and, and give me a couple of glances of where you visualize the podcast going. Okay. Um, the podcast started, would have been mid 2020. So right in the middle of the pandemic is when yeah. it started. Yeah. Uh, had a little bit of time on my hands. So <laughs> seemed like a good time. Believe it or not, it was about four years in the making. I mean, I had been saying for quite a while I needed to do one. And just for lots and lots of what I call reasons, really, excuses, I didn't. Yeah. Um, so I started it. How many episodes? We, we're we dropping episode 45 today, which is April 6th, 2021. So uh, kind of looking forward to episode 50 coming out. For me, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a big one. I mean, I realize 100 is kind of like a super, super big one. But for me, episode 50 is going to be like a, a super big one because it's like you're getting close to a year at that point and you're starting to hopefully you've got some momentum going, that sort of thing. Um, why I started it. Um, honestly, the reason I started it was because I wanted to help two groups that I care a tremendous amount about. I wanted to help guys and I wanted to help entrepreneurs because I'm both. So, <laughs> and it, it stems from my, my divorce. Um, Cause I, I believe that our pain is not for us. I believe that our pain is actually for other people, but the only way our pain can be for other people is we have to do the hard work. We got to put the work in. We got to work through that pain. We can't jump over it, go around it, or pretend, put blinders on, pretend like it doesn't exist because that doesn't help anybody, certainly us. So, but when we put that hard work in and we get to that point where we're starting to see a little bit of breakthrough, that's when we can be of use to other people. It's like, learn from me. But what also comes with that is clarity. As I put the hard work in and I started to learn about the things I did wrong and how I needed to be improving myself in that entire process. Once I started to get through a little bit of that, I started noticing in other people, friends of mine, it's like, dude, you are headed down a path you don't want to go and you can't see it because I didn't see it. And I started talking to him without knowing any details about what was going on. I started asking questions like, you know, what's happening here? Is this happening? What about that? You know, three or four things right off the bat, bang, bang, bang. It's like, there's no way you could know any of that. And I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, I can see it coming. Yeah. And you're going to crash into a gigantic wall and it's going to hurt like worse than anything you've ever felt in your life if you don't start doing stuff now to get it right. That kind of stuff. So that's why I started it because I wanted to turn my pain into my purpose. And now with the podcast, ultimately a platform. So that is a platform that I have to help with that. But in addition to that, I knew I wanted to help entrepreneurs because I've been one for over 20 years. I mean, so have you. So you understand entrepreneurs and what that's, how difficult that can be and what that's like. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to begin to introduce people to amazing other entrepreneurs out there who are doing great things. Now, some who are more generalists, but many of whom are very targeted in what they do you know, bringing in people who are fantastic when it comes to branding, marketing, um, people come in, talk about health, talk about fitness. Um, well, this would be a good point for me to mention this. Uh, during the process of creating the podcast and starting to come out with episodes, one of the things that I did is I came up with something called the F6 formula. The F6 formula is my framework and essentially, it's the six areas of a man's life that he tends to struggle in, especially after getting married. And those six areas happen to be faith, fashion, fitness, food, friendship, and fun. Those six areas. Um, and the interesting thing is I brought on what I deemed to be experts in those six areas and interviewed them. So I would interview them and then I would do a solo episode related to that particular thing. Yeah. And that's kind of like relatively early on in the podcast, not right at the very beginning. I actually dealt with a, um, a pretty intense subject matter early on in episode two. Uh, leadership and suicide was a big one. And honestly, that was because a friend of mine, a guy I went to college and grad school with had committed suicide last year. 
And it just, it was on my heart and I couldn't get away from it. I tried. I tried to not do that episode. Yeah. And I, I couldn't get away from it. It's just like, you know what? I have to do it. It's, it's going to be painful. I'm not going to like it. But there are far too many what I'll call leaders, whether you have a title or not, um, where you're, you're seeing that suicide rate of folks, the, the C-suite kind of folks, you know, it's pretty high. Yeah. And, and it, it doesn't have to be that way. It's because for, for many of us, it's, you feel like there's so much responsibility on you to take care of this thing that you've created. And if you don't feel like you're living up to it for whatever reason, I just was thinking of my friend, Darren. And I honestly, it's like, how did Darren, how did he get to the point in his life where death was the preferable option? I just, I, I still, I mean, it's, and I've talked to experts about this and no one can give me a satisfactory answer. No, I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, I've had a few episodes on our podcast of mental health. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's a powerful subject, right? I mean, you just never yeah. know what somebody's thinking, what somebody's going through. Absolutely. And that outside shell is sometimes very, very sheltered to somebody, what they're actually truly going through. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, 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 and it's, and I, and I, this is something where I, I mean, I didn't even think this, this, our conversation was a goal there today, but it's something where as an entrepreneur myself, there's, I, I think every single entrepreneur goes through situations where, I mean, nothing's ever perfect. You're, you're, you're counting your wins. You're hoping you're getting more wins and losses. You're always on the way up. You're always trying to climb this mountain and you're hoping that you're not slipping back all the time. And it's that mindset, John, where you're all, you question things, you question mm -hmm. relationships, you question. Uh, so I had something on my podcast and we, we had a great conversation and my mind is, and we talked about it before we went on on air. I, I'm the problem solver. I'm the one always. Hmm. People come to me, and, been, and I've been doing this for years and years. I went through three years. We talked about this coaching, and I never charged a penny. Yeah. And it was that mindset of just always, just I just like seeing people do good. So if you were to come to me, anybody come to me, Jeff, I need help with this. I'm not gonna. If I could help you, I'm not gonna charge you. Just if I could help you, I can help you. I'm gonna direct you. But I've realized now that I'm into the self help space or whatever you want to call it. And I'm, and I'm starting into coach before I was just an entrepreneur. I was building, building in my own little world. Now that I'm I got a podcast and I got a book and I, and I, and now that we're in this coaching space, I'm realizing more and more that, and this is hard for me to say sometimes, because I, I don't feel like that myself, but I, I am realizing with other people is in the end of the day, people want you to do well until you start doing better than them. <laughs> It's That's true, a good John. point. That's it a good very point. very true. Yes, yes. And, it, and a lot of people won't admit it, but it's, it's that mindset of you're, you guys are doing well. And, I, and I've noticed from day one, since I started this journey last April, started the mm -hmm. podcast, started reading a book, started getting certified as a coach, started really pushing the coaching business, building the platforms. People from day one are like, oh, this is awesome. And all these guys from the beginning that were so motivational and they're so helping me, now they're seeing how quickly I've grown. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden they're not so supportive. They're more in the back. And, and you, but you get that a lot, John. But yeah. I'm not like that. I don't care. See, in my I'm, mind, I'm, not, there's, I'm not wired up that way either. No, there's 8 million people in this world. There's enough clients for all of us. There's enough yes, people to help. Yes, yes. But absolutely. you have a lot of, and it's just whether people are going to admit it or not, people do not, in general, want you to do better than them. Mm. Which is and, so sad. But but do you not do you not agree with me with that? No, no, I, I agree. There's yeah. plenty of people who are like that. I just I know I'm not wired up that way. You but know, were, honestly, honestly, the, the the since we're talking about coaching for yeah. a moment, the best coaches I have ever encountered, the best ones, are the ones who celebrate the loudest when the people they've coached do better than them. Oh my. Absolutely. Yes. 100%, man. Oh, that's, gosh. that's, 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 and see, that, that's me. That's my man. That's my mentality. Always. It's, yeah. I, I think about in terms of, of people that I hire to do things for me. Yeah. It's like, if I could do it great, I would, but guess what? I want to hire somebody who's better than me. Yeah. I, I want you to outwork me in an area, make me find something else to do. That, that's what I want. I want to see people so 
explode with success. Yeah. And again, I realize that that can be very difficult to define. Yeah. That whole, whole idea of success. Because it is different for everybody. Uh, for me, success has absolutely nothing to do with money. Never has, uh, never will. Uh, it is not about that for me. 100%. I'm, I'm the same mind frame as you. 100%. To me, it's, 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 it, wealth is, is freedom, right? Freedom to do mm -hmm. what you want, when you want, how you want. Yes. I agree with that. If you, could wake up every, if you could wake up every single day and have a smile on your face, have your health, and just be able to enjoy every day by the moment, live in the moment, enjoy the moment, enjoy your friends, enjoy your family, enjoy seeing things. It's, it's that mindset too where if you were to get any single person on their deathbed, I would say a majority of people would say they never truly did what they were meant to do. Mm. Yeah. So my mind is, that's why I'm always changing. Always. The minute I get bored of something, I'm onto <laughs> something else. And, and, I'm and, with it's, you there. And, and it's that mindset of, I want to be able to experience, see, do accomplish as many things in my life that one day when I'm, when it's my time to go, I'm saying, you know what, even if I didn't do everything, I gave it a good run. Yeah. For and, sure. and, and, and as long as you have that mindset and have that mindset also, I've had this from day one and I try to imply this to my children where don't wait for people to do stuff for you. You got something to do. You yeah. want something to do, get it done. And believe me, we talked before we were on air. There's a way to figure out everything. Oh yeah. There is a way to figure out everything. So don't wait for somebody to give you the answers. Sometimes you have to go searching for them and find them yourself. Oh yeah. You know, honestly, one of the things that, that I miss um, and I realize I am not anti-technology. So anybody, yeah. please do not hear me say that. That is not <laughs> what I'm saying. However, I do miss the days when I'll talk about just say kids, because yeah. I can remember being younger. There was no such thing as looking things up on the internet. You didn't find answers that way. I mean, you went to the, the actual library and looked at actual books and checked out books. You know, you looked at things like encyclopedias yeah. and, and other stuff like that. You were actually reading something physical in front of you. You were writing stuff down. My parents um, told this day still have in their basement their, their, their issue of encyclopedias. Nice. <laughs> like this thick. They're oh, brown, yeah. They're matte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, love it's that, like, man. It's just, it's just the way it was. It was a different, it was a different time, right? It was. Oh, it was. I mean, we talked about this the other day i mean my childhood was coming home grabbing a peanut butter sandwich laying up the dog out grabbing my bike and heading out and playing from canada playing ball hockey or baseball till it got dark and came home we were out every yes night. but that's one thing i do with my kids my kids do not play video games john my kids that's awesome man if Love you it. watch my look at my storylines every night we're either going for a bike ride last night yeah, tonight we're doing play, stuff all the time basketball we're, we're playing bait like every single night there's something physical we're doing that's good. Every night. I, I remember the same thing, man, when I was a kid. It's, we weren't allowed to be inside. No. It's like, unless you were sick, yeah. you were outside. I mean, you do your homework, obviously, but yeah. when that's done, you just go. Yeah. Actually, I can remember when I was younger, a lot of times, you didn't do your homework when you got home. You went outside and played till it was dark. And then you came home to your homework. Then you came inside and did your homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, they wanted you out of the house. Yeah, and yeah. you were in a neighborhood. You know, all the kids were together. Well, in addition to that. If you got in trouble, every parent on the block knew. could discipline you. Yeah. Every parent could. It's like, and if you got in trouble at somebody else's house, oh man, were you going to get in trouble at home? When I grew up, we grew in Toronto, Canada, downtown Toronto. And, and, this, and, it, and it was just, it was all these streets and it was so many kids our age. So we had hockey ball hockey teams built for streets. So our name was our, our, our street. And okay. we, would have, we would have, Tournament like games, like tournaments between all the streets. It was like eight or nine streets, and we have nice. we meet in somebody's laneway or somebody's street. And okay, this team's playing this team. Next, the next street, this team's playing. <laughs> and then we, and we have these tournaments and stuff. Like, oh, that's cool. Where do where do you get that? You don't see that ever again, unless you're no. an organized playing an organized sport. You ain't seen that with just a bunch of kids getting together and oh. and and just no, you don't see that anymore, right? That that whole, is a shame. Yeah, yeah. This has been a, a great conversation. It went a lot of areas I didn't think it was going to go. I thought we were going to talk more business, <laughs> talk more stuff. But that's, that's, that's the great thing about a conversation, right? I try yeah. not to have any set questions. 
And I just try to have a good conversation. Today was another good conversation. I think we need to continue this conversation on a couple more podcasts in the future. Oh, for sure, man. I just have one little question I'm going to ask you and I ask all our guests to finish off yeah. today. If something were to happen to you today, in a few words, how would you want to be remembered or described by your loved ones? Okay. Um, I, I guess the best way I could answer that question is, and believe it or not, I've actually thought about this before. Um, I, I think of it this way. What would I want my tombstone to say? Because that's essentially what I would want other people to say about me. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's two things, honestly. It's, it very much sums up where I am. That is, he loved God and he loved people. That's what I care about. Simple, sweet, honest. I love it. Yeah. This has been a pleasure, John. I'm going to put on our show notes how to get a hold of you, how to link yeah. up with you, social media, how to listen to your podcast. If you, um, if your dad out there, or if, uh, like I said, man, entrepreneur looking for coaching too, we're all out there. We're all out to help you. John's a great, mm. great avenue to pass on to. Where is the best spot for our audience to uh, see you or hook up with you if you need it? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm on pretty much all social media platforms. I'm just at John Hewlin. That's H U L E N. But, um, you know, that's LinkedIn, that's Facebook, it's Instagram, Twitter, uh, clubhouse as well. That's my handle on clubhouse. And if you want to listen to the podcast at all, it's just, it's relationships and revenue and anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can, you can find it as well. This is awesome, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for uh, being on the Jeff Nozine podcast. Oh, man, I am so honored to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to just hang with you and talk with you. And hopefully I was able to add some, Value, add something 100%. special to, to your listeners because I, I'm, I'm honored that you asked me to be here today. Thank you, brother.